Hi, I'm Keith Harris, former chairman of the Department of Veterinary Pathology at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And it's my distinct pleasure today to have the opportunity to interview Dr. Uh, Carl Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones has uh, been a major influence in the profession of veterinary pathology for, for well over uh, half a century, continues to be a major influence, uh, has made a major impact on, on many, many uh, pathologists' lives over the years, and was instrumental really in the formation of the specialty of veterinary pathology. And uh, Carl, before I forget, I, I, I just want to make sure you, uh, and I, I think you know this, that uh, you understand the, uh, the, the esteem that uh, myself and other colleagues hold you in and uh, um, I really appreciate the effort that you went through to get us to where we are, where we are now. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you very much, Keith. Well, to, to start off with, uh, I thought, uh, as is typical, and I think in these kind of interviews, is to uh, allow you to discuss, uh, uh, to the extent you would like, mm -hmm. your um, early childhood and uh, maybe from a perspective of, uh, uh, of how you got interested in, in veterinary medicine and veterinary pathology and, mm -hmm. and on, and, uh, and maybe a uh, perspective of, of, of what you learned early on that got you to where you are today. So. Well, thank you, Keith. I uh, have discussed my childhood with uh, my family and my grandchildren, and I'm uh, willing to give it a try uh, because I think some young veterinarians and young people that are, would like to know uh, how I got interested in veterinary medicine because I was not born on a farm. I didn't have uh, early experience on the farm. But when I was 11 years old, uh, my mother was ill and uh, my mother's dearest friend uh, took me to her household uh, and uh, where I became, I thought, employed as, a, as an assistant to her oldest son who had established a dairy when he was in high school. Now this is in Idaho, in this the is, Boise area? This is in Boise, Idaho. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, uh, so I, I did live on a dairy farm for three years from the time I was 11 till I was 13 or 14. And this was about ni early 1920s, 23, 24. Yes, like I right. was born in 1912. And uh, I have fun with that because I now live in New Mexico. And uh, that was the year that New Mexico became <laughs> a state. <laughs> so I've got kind of an ancient mariner out there. But anyhow, to get back to uh, the, my time on the farm, I. I worked on the milk route, and you know, in those days, we had to deliver the milk before breakfast because uh, you, you couldn't keep it overnight because very few people had refrigeration. And some people had ice boxes. And uh, so it meant getting up about uh, four in the morning and getting on the route and back, finished with it by seven in the morning. And I was the bottle hopper. I drop. I carried the bottles of milk into the house from the truck and back. The bottle and hopper. So yeah. it had a title, huh? Right. I had a title. Of First course. job with bottle hopper. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so, uh, but I did everything on the farm. I uh, eventually, I eventually went back there after an interim. After I graduated from high school, actually, and. Uh, was totally responsible for a herd of 50 cows. And I whipped milked them with milking machines. And, and I was pretty competent by that age. So, so that was a great experience. I learned the importance of work. I learned how to budget my time and the value. I learned the value of work. And, and the uh, important thing also in my life was I developed a deep appreciation for animals. Sure. I, really liked the dairy cows and, and all the things that went with them. I didn't especially like the seven day weeks, but uh, yeah. that. Well, I noticed you, you started off in, in uh, college um, in dairy sciences or dairy husbandry. Was right. that your original thinking that you wanted to go into dairy husbandry? Uh, yes, that was my early interest. 
when I went to University of Idaho, uh, and uh, things were touch and go financially, but I did get a scholarship of a hundred dollars from the Union Pacific Railroad. Well, that's a lot of bucks. <laughs> that you was know, money in those hundred days. Dollars now, but that right. was a lot of money. Right, right it was the Union Pacific Railroad. Union Pacific Railroad, and I got a letter from Carl Gray, the president, giving me the award. Wow. And I still have it, of course. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't throw that away. <laughs> but then uh, the next year, partly by, encouraged by uh, David Tate and his brother, who had the, the dairy, the Triangle Dairy, I uh, transferred to Washington State to the veterinary school and okay, so stayed there. You decided down the interim, you decided to go into veterinary medicine. Is right. there anything that particularly uh, pushed you in that direction or motivated you to go well, in that direction? Well, it was partly that I noticed that uh, the, the principal problems in a, on a dairy farm were the animal diseases. Oh, no. oh. And also, I realized that the veterinary medicine was a, uh, gave you a good training in biology, and so you would understand basic principles of biology. Well, you were probably a good student in high school, I presume. And I was a fairly good student in high school. I had a lot of trouble in grade school, but I, I, we won't get into that. I, uh, I was good enough to get into <laughs> university. <laughs> but then, I mean, then you went right into vet school within a year. Uh, was that was it pretty competitive getting into veterinary school? At, uh, that, at that time, time it wasn't particularly competitive to, to get in. It was tough to get through the work. The work was okay. hard. The hard was but, getting uh, through it. And then I, I presume Washington State then covered Idaho. People from Idaho went to Washington State. Oh, uh, yes. Go to veterinary right. school? And I, I guess while you were there then, uh, you obviously at some point in time developed an, an interest in uh, veterinary pathology. And uh, as we were discussing earlier, you worked with Hilton Smith's mm -hmm. pistol lab. Well, this is, uh, I didn't know there was such a thing as, as veterinary pathology when I started. Yeah. Uh, but Hilton Smith, who was a superb teacher, and uh, um, he, he was a, he taught a lot of things, but pathology was his uh, his field. And uh, I'll mention him later when we in, as we talked together because he was an influence uh, the rest of his life. He was an influence on me. And we eventually worked together and on projects. And I'll talk okay. about him a little more. We'll get, we'll stand on but that. he's a very important person in my life as a teacher. Yeah, he did a lot of things. A lot of things with him professionally. Yes, right. Yes. So. Yeah. We'll come back to him, and yeah. I think we have a picture of him here that you will see about right. this time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you want to go ahead and discuss him now, or do you want to wait? Why don't we talk about him a little later when okay. we talk about okay. other events? Okay, sounds good. Well, I think that's, uh, okay, so you, Hilton Smith had a major influence on your uh, interest in pathology, recognizing it as a possibility of a career field to go into. Yeah. And, uh, and well, perhaps I should mention about him at this time, he was also influenced uh, on me to look at the Army as a career. And uh, he, he was very much interested in the Army. When he was at Colorado, he was the cadet colonel of the ROTC when he graduated there. So unfortunately, he had a, an illness that kept him out of the service. And he, that was a deep disappointment in his well, life. Once, is that once World War II began? Yes. He was disappointed right. he couldn't serve? Right. So he was not able to serve. But, uh, well, one, uh, one of the things I noticed, too, you graduated with the uh, highest honors from, uh, from veterinary school. And uh, how was it? Uh, was it tough? I mean, a tough curriculum, tough academic? It was very tough. Um, but fortunately, um, in my work on the farm, with I didn't mention, I spent uh, my high school years living on another farm where I worked with a uh, very unusual, great uh, Norwegian, a fellow of Norwegian descent, who was an engineer. And but the important thing about him, he was superbly organized. He. Even to do chores, he, he said you'd have to plan it in advance as <laughs> you know you're going to do one thing here and don't have to walk back the second time. And uh, so I learned to organize my work, and that was very important when I went to college. So that helped you in college and probably for the rest of your life, I it, it did, right. There's no question about it. Well, I guess that 
So it goes against my theory that you're pretty well locked into your personality by third grade that you can continue to learn. Well, it's amazing how how much you're influenced by your yeah. when you're so very young. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so from uh, veterinary school, uh, you developed, I guess, an interest in uh, in, in the military for, right. from from Smith. Mm -hmm. And uh, were there any other uh, what what else motivates you to go in the army? See the world. I mean, uh, no financially. No, that's very like? interesting. By this time, I'd become interested in research. And uh, at that time, the army had a very famous. Uh, a uh, microbiologist who had written a textbook that I had studied, and his name was Kelser, Raymond A. Kelser. And he was, at, in 1934, he was a major in the Army, and he was in Boston. And I wrote to him and told him what, uh, that I was interested in, in an Army career, particularly if I could do research and get involved in the kind of career he'd had. Yeah. And I had a very nice letter back from him, a two-page letter. And I still have that letter, too. That's cool. I wish I'd brought it. <laughs> but yeah. Well. Next time we do this. Okay, we'll okay. fine. Uh, the, the things he said in his letter was that if you if you pass the competitive exam, which was coming up in those days, they had a competitive exam for the Army Veterinary Corps. If you pass that exam, you'll be commissioned in the regular Army, and you'll be assigned to duty with troops somewhere. And after you, if you accomplish that and learned how to apply your training to the military, you will be considered for something like what they called the um, the Army Medical Research Board. Yeah. At that time, it was a group of scientists who, a group, a group of people in the Medical Corps and the Veterinary Corps, yeah. who were were put to, signed together in where there were disease problems or some yeah. problems to consider. And at, at Kelser was in the, served in the Philippines, and uh, the board was in the Philippines at the time, and he, then he was in Panama. And I was going to ask if he was in Panama. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, eventually, uh, or he, he was at uh, Walter Reed at the Army Institute of Research, or, uh, or at the Army Medical Museum, possibly, as uh, for assignment. So I, t I, I told him in this note that that's what I was interested in doing. I would like to be in the Army, too. I had. Yeah, uh, I felt that was a good place to serve. And, uh, well, he told me he he recommended that I take the exam, and uh, which I did at Salt Lake City, Utah, Fort Douglas, a week in the horrible hot weather. <laughs> it was a week. It was a week's exam, uh. and you, you wrote all morning. You wrote on subjects, say anatomy. And then the afternoon you write on another subject. Was it all veterinarians or was it all veterinarians. physicians and No, these were veterinarians who were applying for the uh, for the army. A lot of them were a lot of them there, or quite a few. Well, there were uh, just a few at Fort Douglas, but all overall all over the country, I bet. Take there were 96 that were took the exam. And uh, six of us passed it. So it was it was six tough. And uh, some of those six you you may know, come think about it. it uh, you know John Rust. He was yeah, here at A5P yeah. at one time. I don't time. know the person. I know who he is. And he was one of the six. He John was one Rust. of the six. <laughs> uh, Bernard Trum. You know him. He was, name. he was later. We were associated at Harvard. And Don Kelly. And I didn't make a list of them, but that's how many three. That's pretty good. You uh, got four. I can remember those right off. And uh, Wayne Shipley. He was in the Surgeon General's office at one time. Uh, there were, oh yeah, there was one, um, well, you know how you get blanks the time you can't think of a person's yeah. name, and after a while I may think of it and well, tell you okay. about okay, we'll come back. But anyhow, there were six of us, and yeah. uh, one, of them, one of them died shortly after, but they, all the rest of them served their whole career in the Army, career in the Army. So, so you, you took the exam, and then you, you uh, reported
reported for duty. Now, did you go right into training after that, or did you go well, to your first assignment? Well, usually, usually officers would come to uh, to Walter Reed to the Army Veterinary School or go to the Medical Field Service School, okay. which was at Carlisle Barracks. I didn't know how lucky it was. I was, but I was assigned to the Presidio of Monterey, California. Wow. A beautiful place. And they had over a thousand horses there. Now this is, so you didn't go initially to training? You no, said. I didn't. I went directly with, uh, with troops. That's what happened. And the 11th Cavalry and the 76th Field Artillery were there. About a thousand horses. They were both horse drawn. And for a veterinarian, this was a, really a challenge. Now, were you doing pr primarily uh, equine medicine, or were you have a combination of that and food inspection? Was food inspection part of the job, too? Well, as it turned out, the, the senior officer there wanted to do the food inspection. So I didn't do much of it. Same, I was there to today, do it. The senior officers did. He did it. Yeah, he did it. Uh, it was uh, uh, Colonel Fitzgerald and later uh, Colonel Lovell. And uh, I had uh, great fun looking after the horses. And I learned to ride. Uh, well, let me just ask you uh, something on that. Something I've always wondered. I mean, you know, we think of horses today, and they're, it's more pleasure, pets. I mean, we're talking. This is business at that time. I mean, you, they, yeah. The military was dependent on these animals. Mm -hmm. So your position was extremely important to the organization, I presume, keeping the animals healthy. Uh, yeah, I was uh, well respected and looked after and uh, helped whenever needed it. And uh, yes, they, they took good care of the horses at that time. Uh, when if we think about it, at about that time, Hitler had more than a million horses in his army. A million. A million. How many more. would you say we had? Uh, I don't know, uh, but it'd probably be in the thousands, a few thousand. We had the the first cavalry division at Fort Bliss, and the uh, uh, and the cavalry and field artillery at at, at uh, Presidio Monterey. And then there were horses at most other posts because most officers were mounted at that time. Yeah. And that changed, of course, when the war yeah. started. So would you say it was still pretty heavy? Horses were depended on a lot all the way up until the start of World War II. Yeah. And I can remember when I was stationed in the Philippines, stories of when the Japanese um, captured the island. I mean, a lot of our, I mean, of course, they were fully, pretty much fully mechanized. Well, we were still very dependent on horses, and it's, it's amazing how the end of that era was so abrupt, I presume. In our uh, yes, uh, w of course, we were a powerful nation. We could make tanks and yeah. vehicles very fast, and there was a problem of shipping loads of hay. It took a lot of space yeah. and, and transport. Uh, so, and okay, so you you obviously learned to ride and. Uh, and you, when, the, when the unit moved, you rode with them? You right, rode as yeah, well. on maneuvers or marches. Yeah, and you, and you learned to play polo at that time as right, well. Right, I did, yes. That was a great, great, was a great game. And, and uh, we had to school all of our horses and start from scratch. To, to have fine, had good animals, good quality animals? Uh, yes, we started getting remounts from the remount service while I was there. And, and uh, they were very good, very good horses. Not as good as some of the moguls that in Hollywood had, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine but compared to today, they were really high, yeah. high quality. Okay, so um, you were you were there on the West Coast until uh, 38, 38, that's correct? Right. And then you moved you moved you moved the East to uh, Walter Reed and attended right. the. The, train, the school. Yes, at that time. The Army Veterinary School. Mm -hmm. Well, how was that? Well, it was very good, although I had already learned a lot of the things just by experience, by being with troops. But it was very helpful where they talk us, taught us to think in ter terms of preventive medicine and, uh, and public health, and uh, uh, those, those features were emphasized. Well, well, did you have a pretty good background in public health and veterinary school? already was that quite emphasized? good yeah we yeah. we had uh, had ex some experience in both uh, meat and dairy hygiene mm -hmm. and in uh, in uh, food uh, uh, meat inspection 
food yeah. inspection. We had had not only courses, but we had had some experience. We'd gone to the packing houses and done some things. Now, you uh, did, uh, were there a fairly large number of military dogs at that time as well? Uh, not when I went in the service. That started during later. World okay. War II. Yes. We'll get to that in a minute then. Yes, we, we, we can that. talk about that later. And what's the Hoskins Medal? Well, this was a um, medal that was um, donated by the American Veterinary Medical Association in the name of, I think it was Preston Hos Hoskins, who was one of their early executive uh, directors of the okay. AVMA, okay, and uh, so it was, it was, it was the medal to be won there. It was for, for the top uh, student. Is that what it was? Yeah, for? your grades and evaluation was, was top. That was competitive. There oh, were, I bet there it were was. Some very good people I in that bet class, it was. And so it was. I bet it was. Now, wh where did you learn? Uh, I guess Army uh, military bearing um, doctrine, that type of thing. Was that kind of on the job training when you were on the West Coast? Uh, that was part. It started uh, abruptly, and I had to learn a lot of things I didn't know about the military. And fortunately, they, uh, people were understanding and knew I'd come right from civilian life. Yeah. So. And uh, eventually, it became the second nature, you know. Yeah, sure. And and uh, there were lots of good people there, interesting people, and, and uh, so I adapted to the Army pretty well. Yeah, well up but until that time, it really wasn't that big of a military. Well, the Army wasn't that big, no, was it? No, no, it was small, particularly compared to the European armies. It was just yeah. very tiny. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in, and then in 39, you then transferred to, uh, to Front Royal, to the Army Quartermaster well, Depot. Is yeah, that I might mention that in thirty-eight, in thirty-nine, January thirty-nine, I left uh, uh, Walter Reed, the Army, uh, where the Army Veterinary School and the Army Dental School and the Army yeah. Veterinary School were located, and went to Carlisle Barracks. Okay, and that was the Medical Field Service School at that time, and it was for quite a while after that. But event now that that uh, activity is at Fort Sam Houston. Okay. And, but uh, there's where we learned to march, give commands, and drill, and, and salute. Uh, salute. And uh, we also had field exercise. We even had a, a mounted um, night ride in which uh, we competed as individuals. Uh, we had to ride from, from um, places on the map that were marked as aid stations and hospitals and so forth. And, and yeah. so it was a military problem, but you had to do it, you time it properly. You had to ride your horse so you timed it exactly right. Wow. And you had to know how, uh, how fast your horse trotted and how fast <laughs> he galloped. It's amazing the difference is what was important. Well, yeah. now, yeah, that's I, right. Now, the, the, the horses, were they the responsibility of the quartermaster corps? Who, who was responsible for the horses in the Army? Who technically owned them, which group? Well, um, the, the, uh, well, the cavalry, they were responsible. The field okay. artillery that were mounted, the horse okay. was a very important integral part okay. of their, just as in part, uh, their, their mode of transportation. Uh, the f feed for the horses and the, uh, came from the quartermaster corps. The housing came from the quartermaster corps. But um, individual units were responsible for their own horses. Okay. And er, er, uh, just about that time, almost all officers were mounted. Even the infantry officers had horses. They, in World War I, they rode horses. You'll see the man riding, that was an officer. Well, uh, so now, the veterinarian, though, was the veterinarian still considered part of the, mil of the medical side of yes. the house with physicians right. and dentists and other we people? We were part of the medical department, okay. the medical service. And we were assigned uh, for duty, uh, like I was attached to the 11th Cavalry when we went on marches and so forth. Well, I don't want to make sure I don't, I've always, something, something else I've always wondered in uh, 
maybe I can address it now, is that we, we talked about how uh, the, the switch from using horses to you know, mechanized methods of, of movement, how dramatically that affected the number of horses. I mean, the Army went from right. being uh, eating horses badly to not really needing them anymore. Right. Well, how did that impact veterinarians? I mean, certainly the, uh, the I mean, right. you would think they would have cut way back on their need for veterinarians. Well, veterinarians were still used in food inspection and, and hygiene work. And uh, there were a few, quite a few, were assigned to the remount depots where the horses were, were installed, were kept, expecting they might be used. Okay. And so they were kept uh, through most of the war. So, the and I guess that's a good transition to the, to the, the depot, the remount depot at Front Royal. And so they took, as the war, as the war developed, there was not really a need for all these horses. They had this huge inventory of horses, and they went to remount depots. Right. And they held them until they, they were the exposed. Just hung out there, mm -hmm. and yeah. that's that was your main job from thirty-eight, um, thirty-eight to thirty-nine. Uh, yes. Yeah. And you did that really throughout World War II. Right. There at Front Royal. And that was the Army's veterinary U.S. Army Veterinary Research Laboratory, and uh, I was assigned to it and. In, uh, so you're assigned to the research laboratory versus a clinical right. veterinarian. Okay. Yeah. And okay. I had no clinical duties. I just okay. had the research lab. And this was partly due to the fact that this um, person I'd written the letter to back in 34 is now a brigadier general He's in, looking in at the it surgeon general's bit. office. And he was interested in having somebody set up oh. this lab. Uh, and he asked me while I was here well, I was still interested in doing what I said I wanted to do back in '34, and I'm sure he knew was. And uh, sure enough, uh, I was ordered there. I mean, during all this time, anything you that qualified you for this position, you were learning. I mean, you were you were basically self-taught, post veterinary school, right? right? Yeah. And oh, and before we forget too, there's one story I've heard you uh, uh, give before. Was your first paper? the first publication you had that oh, might yeah. be worthwhile to. Well, uh, this was uh, in 1938, the 11th Cavalry was asked to participate in the fiesta in San Francisco, which was celebrating the uh, opening of the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, wasn't very long ago. That's a little while ago. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was at a staff meeting when they were discussing this March. We're going to march up there. It was 125 miles. And uh, the question was, a lot of the surface the horses would have to go on was, was hard surface, either concrete or macadam. Or. And an uh, officer there said, well, you know, at the St. Louis Depot, there are a bunch of, of rubberized horseshoes that are made for this kind of work. And he said, I don't know how many they have there, but I think we could get them. And sure enough, they, they did send us those horseshoes from yeah. St. Louis. Well, there were about half enough to shoe the horses. And my suggestion that we find out how they useful they were by shoeing half the horses and using the other half as controls. And much to my amazement, uh, they accepted this. And. Uh, I suggested we make a study of the, see what the difference in injuries and how the horses went on the, on the surface. And uh, I would work with the stable sergeants and the troop commanders to keep track of the, how the horses did. And we would, we would know something more about whether the issues were really sure. what they were supposed to be. And they had a, a leather pad that went, went under the iron shoe. The iron shoe was cut off at the heel. And then at the, the back over the frog was a, a rubber, solid rubber pad about four inches wide and two inches, wo uh, four inches long, about two inches wide. And so we did that. And uh, uh, the, uh, the stable sergeants particularly were enthusiastic about it because they said the horses, as soon as they had those pads on their front feet, 
they would go walk freely and it wouldn't be tentative and they wouldn't be no, really? losing their stride. And uh, well, when we, when we finally got back, I uh, assembled the data and uh, and wrote a little report for the Army Veterinary Bulletin. And it was accepted and it was published. Uh, that was the first paper I wrote. So that came up again on my CV when I was being considered for professorship in, at Harvard. So I can tell you that yeah, story. That's they, okay. they had a lot of fun with that. Yeah, I bet they did. You're uh, so that's number one publication on your Yes, right. Your, so I kept CV. it there. I, at times I thought, well, it really was. Well, what was uh, the conclusion? Well, the conclusion, it was useful. Oh, right. so did, the Army, did the Army buy a bunch more of them and implement uh, them? No, I don't think so. Nobody, no, not as far as I know. No, the brass read the paper. No, no, nobody <laughs> read it. But <laughs> it was scientific. I had a, a note after that um, from a man that I knew, but I saw him at lunchtime. Who, his name was Steve Kufler, and he was one of the first neuroscientists at Harvard. And he wrote me and he said, uh, Dear Professor Jones, I would like to um, read your opus on horseshoeing. <laughs> and, uh, well, I had to find the, the journal and photostat it because I didn't have any reprints. And I sent him a photostatic copy. And he came back and uh, thanked me for it. And he said it reminded him, him of his days as a boy in Hungary. <laughs> and I, I really re appreciated this bit of humor with him. and. Uh, because uh, he was a very brilliant young man. He, he should have been a Nobel Prize winner, but he died, uh, unfortunately, early. So. Well, now, while you were uh, at the research laboratory, you worked on, I know, a number of infectious diseases in, in horses. Um, Any ones in particular that stand out? That well, discuss? my assignments were really two, two sentences. One is to find the uh, a means of prevention of equine influenza and the study of the disease. And the other one was to find the cause and means of control of equ what was called equine periodic ophthalmia. And that's the only written instructions I had all the time <laughs> I was there. <laughs> so, so a pretty big assignment. Find out everything you know about it and, and find out a way to prevent it, right? I mean, just, you know. uh, the reason that this laboratory was established was that uh, when the horses were accumulated in the, de in the remount depots, brought from farms, they very often developed respiratory disease. And this was sure. the worst problem. It was called equine influenza because it was very much like what happened to the troops. The young recruits would come to a, depo to a recruit depot and they would get sick. And of course, they did have the 1918 outbreak and sure. w of influenza. So there was a lot of interest in whether the equine disease has it, what relation it might have to the human disease. Uh, to jump ahead in our story, it turned out that it wasn't an e influenza virus. It was a herpes virus. And the virus we isolated was um, it's now known as herpes, equine herpes so virus. So you all isolated that? Yes, we isolated it and passed it in. That was one of the problems we had was we couldn't get it going in a suitable small animal, but uh, we passed it in horses. Well. In, horse, in horses, so. And uh, a later a vaccine was made from. Did from it, was that, that made in the arm by the army or? No, it was made by the University of Kentucky. Okay. And it's still being used, I think. Same vaccine, yeah. using your virus? Yeah. As far as I know, they're still using it. <laughs> So that's okay. So now, wh where did you, did you have a, a nice lab and a lot of laboratory support and <coughs> trained technicians, or did you kind of put it all together and build it yourself? Well, we had a, a single building that had a main room that was turned into a laboratory and a room for an office and a room for preparation of media in another room that was there. And it, uh, the equipment was shipped in. Uh, General Kelser had ordered it, and, and it was a modern field laboratory for that time. And 
young people that work in laboratories now would consider this totally antiquated. First place, uh, we had no plastic glass or glass, plastic uh, utensils. We had to wash all of our glassware and sterilize it. We had no prepared media. We had to make it ourselves, mm -hmm. sterilize it. Uh, we did have a centrifuge and we had a refrigerator and we had microscopes. So it was pretty, uh, by the today's standard, it was a pretty limited pretty laboratory. Pretty but it, it was useful to start out the studies that we, we had to do. About uh, it must have been uh, really neat to be work on these diseases that uh, be on the cutting edge and making just breakthrough discoveries like that. Well, uh, looking back on it, we had very primitive equipment. Yeah. Uh, tissue cultures hadn't been developed for study of viruses, yeah. so we had to depend on animals. And uh, it was a challenge, and it was great fun. I had a very good time there working on these problems and frustrating at times because of the many negative experiments sure. you do. I had some, a couple of good people that came there during the time I was there. One of them was uh, Fred Maurer, who came into the service from Cornell, and he had a career in the Army. Yeah, you know, he was here at the Fred FIP, Maurer, yeah, you know his, his name. Department, yeah. And the other one was uh, Tom Roby, who uh, was there during the war. He was a very competent young man. So, um, well, but no, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask you, during this time, what was the state of the, uh, state of the profession, uh, veterinary microbiology and pathology, I presume pathology, or, or we'll start with pathology, the state of veterinary pathology at the veterinary schools during this time? Well, it was generally, there were good people, some very good people, and Hilton Smith was one, and and uh, uh, Cor Cornell uh, had a very good pathologist. But they didn't have very big staff. They had very few people, although I'd worked as a technician for Hilton yeah. Smith, and that's one of the ways I became interested in it. But they were not very well um, uh, supported financially. They didn't have a staff in depth for so that anyone could specialize. And uh, uh, things have changed since that sure, time. Sure, yeah. uh, So truly, the, yeah. the, at that time in the Army was a great opportunity for somebody who wanted to go into research. I mean, we talked about how primitive your equipment was, but yeah. it was probably pretty good compared to... Well, we had the diseased animals to, to study, and that was the big advantage. Uh, incidentally, I should mention that um, during this time, um, I made regular trips to the Army Medical Museum yeah. in Washington, which was 55 miles away, in order to get consultation and also to I attended the seminars. By train or drive? Did you drive I drove. I drove. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the commanding officer of the post gave me a car, so I had a oh, car right. and a driver. So I came up in style. But I got great support from the Army Medical Museum. They even took my tech, some of my technicians and trained them to cut saloidian sections. And I had a superbly trained technician from a, uh, made from a sergeant who had no training at all in medical work. And so they trained them here? In, uh, they trained them here at the, Ar at the Army Medical Museum. So I was very... Uh, pleased and, and indebted to the museum for the help I got at that well, time. Well, who were your first contacts here, I mean, your first memories of the, I presume you already knew about, the, heard about the Army Medical Museum, but who were your first contacts here? Well, Colonel Ash was the curator, and later the, to call the director, uh, and he'd been there for quite a few years. He's a well-known uh, expert in pathologic anatomy. He was very, very good, and he gathered around him a staff of young people and of middle-aged people, and he brought uh, Professor Baldwin Luquet from the University of Pennsylvania to be his deputy, and he had accumulated a staff of experts 
which made the Army Medical Museum a world center for pathology. So at this, this was the time during the war I spent some time with them and started to learn more about pathology, learn how to, to learn by myself. And uh, I got help from many of the staff. Almost every one of the staff sometime helped me sure. in some way. They were very, very cooperative. Okay, let so, me just back. It's now an appropriate time to talk about Ash a little bit. Oh, uh, yes, sure. Well, I mean, of course, Colonel Ash is uh, well known oh, of by course, people yeah. that have been at AFIP and mm -hmm. recognized as really a visionary pathologist. Yeah. We know that because he, he recognized the importance of veterinary pathology. Right. But maybe expand on him a little bit and, and, and the, importance, the important piece he played in the development of veterinary pathology. Well, uh, perhaps I can tell a little story that it, while I was going there as a visitor and I got to know him and I had the temerity to go and talk to him about what I visualized for the future and I suggested that the, Ar the Army Medical Museum would be an ideal place to uh, uh, start a collection and a study site for veterinary pathology and that w it would be comparative and that available to the whole staff to look at animal d diseases sure. and and compare those that are similar and those that are different and uh, I recognized the the number of brilliant people who were there to, to consult on things like neuropathology yeah. and on and yeah. on and uh, so I told him that I, th that I thought that was a good idea, and and he said, uh, yes, I agree. He had already thought of it, and he actually had already st started to establish a veterinary section uh, at that time. Now this we're we're talking the late 30s, 39, 40, this is 41, the, something uh, like that. 39 or 40. Okay. In their early 40s, and uh, I think he told me that. He and Bill Feldman, who was at the Mayo Foundation there, Bill Feldman was a veterinary pathologist, were working on establishing a registry of veterinary pathology, a registry that would cover animals. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this registry was established in 1944. And uh, uh, I think through, through Bill Feldman's influence, I just guess at this, but Charlie Davis, C.L. Davis, who was the found, foundation was later later named at, sure. after, was he was with the Department of Agriculture in Denver, okay, and he was commissioned in the Army and brought to the Army Medical Museum, and he served there for two years and started the so registry. So, so Dr. Davis in 44 um, established the registry of veterinary pathology. He started there it, two right, years. Yeah. And he got it off to a good start. Well, well, before we leave him, tell me a little bit about Dr. Davis, what type of person well, he was. Well, uh, I got to know him pretty well, and I, I knew him partly through the people that he worked with after he left there, and he was, he was, he, he was a good pathologist. He had seen a lot of material. He was competent in, in the things that he dealt with. But he was also, he was friendly, and the staff and the junior people around all liked him. And, and I liked him. I, I thought he was a very interesting man. But the important thing about him was his enthusiasm. He could sit down to a microscope and this is, and look at a slide, and ordinary people wouldn't see anything. But he could see beauty in it, and he yeah. could see interest. He had he could, passion. He had a passion, passion. for it. Yeah. And uh, most. Uh, people in pathologic anatomy had that passion for yeah. seeing what was in the tissue, what yeah. what it was doing, and what it signified, which was an important thing. So uh, he uh, he got it off to a good start, and he stimulated many young people to go into pathology just because of his enthusiasm. And his, uh, so. now, meanwhile, you're coming back and forth from Front Royal, right, and spending a. Mm -hmm. um, one day, at least one day a month, right. attending conferences, probably interacting with with uh, with Charlie Davis, with, yes. with Dr. Davis. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing too, before we leave Front Royal, um, I'd like to discuss Front Royal just briefly. 
Um, of course, today, uh, the National Zoological Park, which is part of the Smithsonian Institutes, mm -hmm. uses, I think, the same facility or the, the, uh, for uh, maintaining uh, some of their, particularly, I think, their, their hoof stock and other animals. Um, just expand on Front Royal just a little bit. Well, Front, Front Royal was, a, was an Army depot, but it also had quarters for their officers and, and men in barracks, and they had uh, uh, facilities for, at one time they had about 12,000 horses there, so they, it was wow. a very large uh, wow. space, and they had uh, uh, barns for all the horses, and the, uh, for the rearing of, ho of horses. They had stallions, which are uh, part of the breeding program that had been started years before. And uh, it was a very going concern. And they, they uh, made every effort to keep the animals that they had in good shape and ready to be used in the, by the military. And uh, well, after the war, some few, few years after the war, the, the depot was closed, the animals were disposed of. And it was turned over to the Department of Agriculture and they established a beet, beef experiment station there for a few years. And then it was turned over to the Smithsonian for a uh, exotic animal uh, yeah. breeding facility. I went back there a few years ago with uh, some other veterinary officers that had served there at the same time. And the post was very much like it had been. The headquarters was still the headquarters for the, par for the park. And the officer's quarters were, st were living quarters. And uh, the stables, instead of having horses in them, had uh, exotic animals of various kinds. Yeah. And the fields, instead of having horses in them, well, some of them had, they had some Przewalski you know, horses, you know, the primitive horses. Yeah. Uh, that were named out that after this colonel in the Polish army. Uh, there was, they had a herd of them wow. in on the field where, where I had one time had a group of experimental horses that I was studying. So what a beautiful area. It's though. a beautiful area now and, and uh, we had to overgraze because we had so many animals but now they had lush pastures and it's a very interesting place and if you ever get a chance to go there I'd recommend oh, it and see it. Okay, so you've got Dr. Davis is starting the registry, you're interacting with him uh, and it's in this 40, 45 war ends. They moved the research lab to Fort Robinson, Nebraska. Did you go with it? Yes. And so you're there a short time um, and then came, came to the Army Medical Museum. Is That's that right? That's right. About six months I was in Nebraska. Now, CL and, and, and Charlie Davis was already gone. Yes, Charlie Davis left in October 1945. And we have an interim registrar was um, Hans Schlumberger, who was a uh, excellent comparative pathologist. He had he was a, had a good background from Germany in in biology, and he really was interested in the, in animal tissues. And uh, did I tell you the story when I first met him? When I yeah, tell that story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So uh, now we're talking. We're talking now 46. 46 March. You've just well, arrived back at. I arrived there and brought a lot of specimens from from, from Fort Robinson. And Elson Helwig was uh, uh, showed me around at the building. And and he, Dr. Helwig was what at that time? Uh, he was this, he was assistant to the director. Okay. Chief of pathology at that time. Hans Smetna was the chief. Okay. But Hel Helwig was. Matter of fact, he came there about the same time I did. Okay. And we shared an office for a while. But he, he was a good friend and a good teacher, so I, I really got to know him well. But um, he was introducing me to the various staff members. And we're in one office, and this was at the old Red Brick Building, which we'll see a picture of. Yeah. And uh, somebody, a voice cried, uh, Jones, did you say Jones? And then a fellow burst in the door, in a white coat, and he said, are you Jones? And I said, I had to admit it, of course, that's who I was. And he says, my God, am I glad to see you. And this was Hans Schlumberger. He said, you know, I didn't have any trouble with the tumors. I could classify them, and that was fine. 
but all those other diseases that they have, all <laughs> kinds of infections. And he was just floored by it. He says, I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> well, I did see a lot of material, that some so, of it that I understood. So you turned over the, uh, the uh, red, he turned over the registry to you, but he right. stayed on, is that correct? Yes, he was there on the staff. So you continued to interact with him yes, and during, for, during his time Yes, and everybody there. else on the staff there, too. So. Well, so now how were, okay, the, the staff at, uh, at the Army Medical Museum had been uh, exposed to veterinary pathologists through Dr. Davis, through you. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly that was, uh, were you all somewhat of a novelty? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, generally to the medical profession we were a novelty, although a few uh, medical physicians had contact with veterinarians. When I did uh, Dr. Ash, Colonel Ash, uh, what, why was he promoting uh, veterinary pathology? Was it because he recognized the need for to have animal pathologists, or did he also recognize the value of comparative pathology and animal models and 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 learning uh, more about human disease through yes, studying? Yes, he, he kind felt of this was another dimension of pathology, and that it was useful for the medical profession to have to know about veterinary pathology and to know about diseases in, in animals because they were very, in some ways, very similar, very identical. And sometimes they're enough different to be interesting. From, uh, so uh, this was the, his reason, uh, and this was the same reason they wanted a veterinarian at Harvard. They wanted somebody to represent the kinds of things, disease that occurred in animals that they wouldn't ordinarily it encounter. Opens up whole new avenues for them, doesn't it? Right, it, it did. It uh, gave them uh, a different uh, ideas about research and, and about disease in, in people because they could uh, follow them more thoroughly in animals and, and uh, uh, so this the door was opened on that sure. for that reason I didn't I didn't have to knock on the door but. well tell me uh, if you don't mind uh, dr. Ash I mean we know how important he was to the to the veterinary profession but maybe a little insight on on him as a person well he was he was a very quiet person in general. He was short in stature for most of the people in the Army. He just barely got over the height requirements. Uh, he was quietly persistent. He wasn't noisy or anything like that. He was quietly persistent in his ideas. and He was a good leader. He demanded a lot from the people, and he demanded a lot of himself. And at that time, he was... Um, probably as good as any of the chiefs of pathology in, in, in medical schools. He, he was, no question about it. And he had a good sense of humor. He was, he was a nice guy to be around. People liked him. He, just, he was informal with the staff. The staff, civilians could be very informal with him. And he was a well, you might say, well-loved person. Uh, so I got to appreciate him very much because he he, was, he, he kept an eye on me and see that I didn't get too far <laughs> out of line. <laughs> and he help, helped me when he thought I needed it. But in general, I had my own engine and interest in pathology by that time. So. Okay. Well, we're about to the end, I think, of this first tape. And what I would like to do, it's okay with you, is when we come back is maybe expand on a few more of the people, uh, Luque and, and Smetna a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, any others you would like to, to discuss, and then maybe discuss the building itself. Um, again, your, your uh, views on, uh, or get a feel for what the old red brick building was like, mm -hmm. and then maybe uh, you were, I believe you were here during the transition time too, to where they were actually contemplating and then started the process of building right. the current Right, yes, I was. Institute. I moved into the new building when it was finished. Yeah. Okay, so when we come back, that's what we'll talk about. Very good. Okay, That'll thank be you. great. Yes. Carl, we uh, just spent a bit of time talking about uh, Dr. Ash. I thought now we would move to a few other uh, individuals that were at the uh, then um, Army Medical Museum that, that influenced the development of your early career. And I'm thinking of like Dr. Lequet and uh, uh, Smetana and, and then uh, some of the consultants you had at that time for the registry. Uh, Yes, in March 1946, I came to Washington to the Army Medical Museum, 
which was at that time located at 7th and Independence Avenue here in Washington. And we probably could, you could see the picture of it. Uh, yeah. The building was built in 1880. We don't have to look at it, I don't miss it right now. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, it consisted, it was a four-story building, and half of it was occupied by the Army Medical Museum and the other half was occupied by the uh, uh, Army Medical Library. And those two had been associated since their inception. And when they were established by General Hammond, uh, the, uh, uh, Colonel Ash was the director and uh, his uh, associate, his uh, deputy was Baldwin Luquet, who was a very outstanding pathologist from the University of Pennsylvania. And he was all there all during the war. And uh, there were other people that were important, particularly important to me in my training because they, I could go to them any time for help and they uh, kept an eye on me. And uh, that included Elson Helwig, who's still with us, has been chief of pathology for a long time. And he and I were in the same office for a while. And it was the office that had, had belonged to Walter Reed himself really? in the old building. Yeah. There was a plaque on the door that said this was the office of Walter Reed. Oh, wow. So and, you and Dr. Helwig were in there together? Yeah, and with four other people. But uh, we had a good time. We were crowded. At, the space was at a premium, but we were crowded together, but we well, what, had a good time, and I enjoyed being there, that, there with them. That, well, what uh, uh, stands out about Dr. Helwig that you think of him? What do you think of? Well, he, he mm -hmm. was a very competent pathologist, quiet, uh, steady, hard worker, and uh, he was always available for to talk about anything that I wanted to talk to him about. He also on several occasions uh, put together some human material on uh, different lesions that uh, I th was seeing in animals and I would like to compare them yeah. so I could compare them and, and uh, I remember we described, we compared keratoacanthomas in dogs and with humans and I was convinced they were the, essentially the same lesion and uh, he was a good friend and uh, uh, it, I was privileged to be able to study with him and under him. Well, what what uh, was the atmosphere like at the Army Medical Museum at that time, and uh, just a general feeling among the among the staff? It's a pretty exciting place. To well, be. it it had been a very exciting place, and it still was all during the war because material was coming in from everywhere, you know, uh, and uh, they were they were the central consulting lab for the whole world. And we were getting animal material from around different parts of the world by this time, too. So it was a, it was a very, you might say, hivey place, very uh, in intellectually stimulating place. A lot of interaction between different uh, uh, departments and different people. Oh, yes. Uh, the whole staff uh, was uh, kind of interacting all the time, it seemed, not only through the conferences, but with me, I could go to any department and sit down and, and talk about animal material, show them animal material. Pretty informal, I guess. It was very informal, and uh, it was a very nice place to be. Well, was there, were there any other uh, institutions that had similar situations where they had veterinary pathologists working closely with, with physicians? There were not many. Uh, I think Bill Feldman at the Mayo Foundation had the nearest to uh, interacting with the medical staff and uh, okay. uh, but uh, I remember particularly uh, of course Han uh, Hans Smetna was the chief of pathology uh, was succeeded by Helwig uh, by Elson Helwig and he was helpful to me because he would sit with me for hours if necessary to talk about animals. Just talk about animals. He just loved it didn't he? And yeah. so I was learning all the time and uh, getting good information from people who knew what they were talking about. I also uh, uh, studied with Webb Haymaker in neuropathology and uh, 
he, he encouraged me to go over and take the neuropathology course with the medical students that he was teaching. So he was a great deal of help to me. And, and I mentioned Lent Johnson. He was a very enthusiastic guy, still full is. of, still is, I guess. But, but he was full of ideas about things that should be studied and yeah. ideas for research. And, and uh, he was not afraid to stick his neck out any time. Uh, he still no, still no, is not afraid think, to, I, I don't guess. Think that ever. But he was an interesting personality too. But he was a, a lot of help to me. Okay, so, so dear, okay, go ahead. Anybody? I know there are a lot of others there. whose names that don't come to me right at the moment. But uh, so these were kind of your formative years in learning um, basic veterinary pathology, and then growing in uh, in that base. I guess, of, of knowledge. And then you had consultants, too, that uh, interact with the group. Uh, yes. Uh, the uh, the co consultant program was started during the war. I don't know exactly when, but uh, pathologists, outstanding pathologists from all over the country came there to consult with the staff. MDs and veterinarians? Uh, MDs and veterinarians. Well, actually, there weren't many veterinarians up until I got there, although Bill Feldman hadn't been a consultant uh, there. Uh, but Hilton Smith came as a veterinary consultant, as a consultant, and uh, um, I have a block on on uh, pathologist's name at Olufsen, Peter Peter Olufsen. At Cornell. At Cornell, he came down, was a consultant with us. And uh, in addition to that, there were. Uh, there were four professors of pathology at Harvard that were all consultants. Arthur Hurdy was the head of the department, and uh, Shields Warren was the pathologist at the Deaconess Hospital, and the uh, and head of the uh, they had a research laboratory there at, at the at the. Uh, a connection with the Deaconess Hospital, and they were, they were doing some of the work, radiation work that uh, Shields Warren was interested in, and he appointed me uh, as an associate there, and I went over there once a week and and uh, sort of supervised their animal colony and also engaged in some of the research, and uh, Gus Damon who was at the Brigham at the time, and he appointed me a associate in pathology there at the Brigham in veterinary pathology. And he was very influential in getting me there, one of those, in fact, it's all four of these, but Gus particularly, he said, he told the faculty that they should have a veterinarian here on the veterinary pathologist who could keep, could tell them something about the kinds of things were happening in so the that was kind animal of work. how you got your, uh Put in the door, so to speak. In That's right. Though, and then the other person was Sidney Farber, who later was the, you know, the Farber Cancer Research Center was named after him. He had, uh, so those four people I had met here in, at the FIP, and uh, they were very influential in getting me an appointment, and they were also influential in getting me uh, places to work and for trainees to work. At Harvard. Okay, one, one thing uh, I'd like to get a, a flavor for is what it was like in the old red brick building. And I'm just going to show a few slides here, if that's right. okay, just yes, to give us, a, give us a feel for that. And the, uh, the red brick building was built in 1880 and was still standing but was very crowded during the war. And, The museum part of the building was moved across the street to temporary buildings or across the street. This is Independence Avenue that you see in the picture. And the, uh, the uh, east side, the east half of the building was now the Army Institute of Pathology. It eventually was called that. And uh, you can see there's a, a very large uh, window and that opened into the public museum, which was was open to the public, and many visitors came there. Okay, now what part moved across the street? The 
uh, museum part. Okay, the but not the public part. Uh, yes, the public part. Okay, moved so eventually it moved it all. Eventually it all came out to Walter Reed, but it all moved across the street to make more room for the uh, for, for the uh, for the staff and, okay. and the pathologists. So there were pathologists all over the place in this building. And eventually I occupied a uh, office on the first floor, which is that corner window you can see in the picture there. Well, that's your office, huh? That was where my office was. Joe Bernier, the dental pathologist, and I shared an office there. So by the time you moved in, though, they'd already moved out the the um, the exhibits the exhibits, from the museum were across, across the street, the street to make yeah. more room. Right. And it was recognized they needed a, another building for the museum piece yeah. of this. That's interesting. I guess it was the uh, fourth window, not the corner one. That was that was the uh, museum, something in the museum. But that uh, first office, and you know, we were just about three or four blocks from the railroad uh, switchyards, which are still there. But at that time, they were operated by coal and steam. So every morning, the windows were sort of loose. You come in, the first thing you did is clean off your, the coal dust off your microscope cover and your desk, and then go over the window sills and wipe them, the dust off of them. The floors were usually taken care of, but they never did get all the sus. Well, so heard, we had that to deal with. But well, I heard this was a beautiful building, but it was inadequate for the needs. It was totally needs. inadequate, uh, yes, it was. No question about it. A lot of things could not be done in that building. And they had been planning for a long time for, for the new building. To, and there are many fluctuations in the plan. They finally decided to separate the library from the, from the institute, from path the Pathology Institute. And, and the library became the National Library of Medicine and was built out at NIH in, in Bethesda. And it was decided to build the new building for the, which was now called the Army Institute of Pathology, AFIP, it was built at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. So they were going to move a new building to, to Walter Reed, it would be the Army Institute of Pathology, and then would the museum then move back into the red brick? Is that what the idea was? Uh, that's what the plan was. Okay. But uh, eventually the uh, administration decided that they would tear down this building and uh, the Hirshhorn Museum okay. of Modern Art was built at that site. So, so there was an interval, interval of time after this building was built, that the um, that the museum did occupy this building. Yes, it did. For several and years. And these pictures, or some of these pictures here, now, is this picture this is here? A picture or is this predate that? This is the inside of the museum with the display cases and the uh, on the mezzanine and the main floor. Now, is this after the the new building was built and they vacate in the uh, the, no, the no, Army I think Institute? this was an early picture back. Uh, that predates uh, that predates time. all the movement, and that was when the the public museum was here. Okay. Well, what uh, was that now? So you had an opportunity to go in the into the and in, into the exhibit areas when the museum was in the red brick building. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And I've heard that it was just a wonderful, uh, wonderful museum. Is that? It uh, it was uh, it was attractive to the public because there's so many displays of different. Uh, medical items, including uh, fetuses in all stages of gestation. And uh, there's some interesting things to, to pathologists that were not on public display, but yeah. but it, it, I don't know how many million people came through there every every year. So it was, and uh, I hope that someday it'll be replaced by the the health museum they're working on now, yeah. somewhere in, in the mall. They certainly need it. Uh, I don't know whether we're ready to talk about the uh, the ACVP yeah, or not. Sound, that sounds good. This um, this picture of the uh, museum uh, reminds me that uh, 
when I was being shown around there in March of 1946, we went into the museum and all of the, all of the cases, all the exhibits were out of there. They were across the street. And there were desks and, and uh, microscopes all through that, on the mezzanine, main floor and everything. And I, I think it was Elson Helwig was with me and I said, what's this going on here? And he said, well, you know, during the war, and this is now at the end of the war, uh, during the war, uh, many medical pathologists served in the army. And at the end of the war, it was decreed that anyone who had an interest in, in pathology could come and spend three months uh, extended duty at the army. It was now the Army Institute of Pathology, I think. And, and Elson Helwig told me that there were, at that time, 95 pathologists, young embryo, embryo pathologists. And what, I said, well, they're all busy. They're all studying. Nobody's talking. They're just working there. And he said, yes, they're preparing for the American Boards of Pathology. And they're going to take them. And, and many of those are going to come, go to medical schools and other institutions, hospitals, where they need uh, certified pathologist. And I thought right then, boy, if we could if we could stimulate our veterinary pathologist to in, be, buy a, an examination or something for them or work before, we could really make a great deal of progress in veterinary pathology. So it was here that the idea came that we would um, form a international examining organization who would set standards in, for excellence or accomplishment in veterinary pathology and give an examination and certify those that were qualified. Sure. And uh, I discussed this first with, uh, with Hilton Smith, who we mentioned early. He, he, he and I have been talking about ways to improve the veterinary pathology and strengthen it. And this was one of the things we talked about as a certifying organization. And my neighbor at the Department of Agriculture was Herman Seibold, a very competent pathologist. He was just a block away on Independence Avenue. And I, uh, so I knew him and I talked with him about various things. And one Saturday afternoon following the the meeting of the Washington Society of Pathologists, uh, he and, uh, Herman Seibold and his colleague <coughs> in the Food and Drug, who was the chief pathologist of the Food and Drug Administration. An MD. A, a physician named A. A. Nelson. He said, you can <coughs> call me Square Nelson because A squared. Right. <laughs> Very nice guy. And we went to a, a bar on, down on, on 7th Street it's no longer there, it's gone. But, uh, and sat down this Saturday afternoon and we talked about, I, I suggested, the, I like their opinion on. This is 46, about 46, 1946. This is probably in 40, yeah, in 46. Okay. Or early, maybe early 47. Okay. Well, 46, I think it was. And uh, uh, both of them were enthusiastic. They thought it was a good idea. And Nelson particularly was foresighted. He said that if you can, if you can develop a nationally recognized examination and certifying organization, he says, I'm sure that, that the food and drug will, it needs your people that are qualified and will use them. Use them as witnesses and use them to review animal studies. And he said, I think it would be a very good step nationally if you could do this. And he predicted that uh, there would be a big field in Tox Pass. And at, at that time, I didn't, hadn't guessed it, but he certainly told me about it. And he opened my eyes to the fact that something eventually did come true. But, so from there, we searched uh, with Hilton Smith and Herman Seibold and I. We went over all the veterinary pathologists we knew that were in and key positions were 
heads of department in veterinary schools or in research institutions and who were qualified in pathologic anatomy. And we came up with a list of 22 people searching the whole country. And, uh, and organized a, uh, or planned a meeting and we contacted Bill Feldman and asked him to sign a letter to each of these 22 people, inviting them to attend a meeting in Chicago at the Palmer House. And uh, he agreed to do it, provided that I signed the letter too. So I was very happy to do that. We both signed the letter. And that led up to the first meeting of what became the American College of Veterinary Pathologists. And we met, uh, if we skip ahead here, we met in Chicago in and Bill Feldman presided, and he, he got up and said, well, I'm presiding at this moment because this is my room. <laughs> <laughs> he just took charge. He, so he said, took over well, that one. The real, well, that was an yeah, understatement. He was, he was the... Uh, Bill Feldman was the outstanding veterinary pathologist and comparative pathologist in the country at that time. He was well known both by veterinarians and by medical people. Well, he's the one that kind of opened the door to it at... Uh, the Army Medical Museum too, right? Dr. Feldman, as far as he was at Mayo. He was at the Mayo Foundation. Right, and he was his, he was involved with, with yeah. uh, recommending. And he was the first chairman of the committee on, of the AVMA okay. on the registry. And he, he and, and Colonel Ash actually did it, you know. Yeah. And they got a committee to, and the committee still exists, I guess. Yeah, it uh, sure does. Yeah. Well now, okay, so, Following, uh, you, you met at the Palmer House, and then you incorporated in the District of Columbia, officially. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then in 48, you applied uh, for recognition by the ACVP. Now, by the, the ACVP... By the AVMA. What did I say? AV, right. The AVMA. The American Veterinary Medical and Association. That, and, and this is not like they had 20 other colleges. This was the first... This was the first one. They never had any such... So I presume you had to convince them that this was something, the profession... Yes. I went to the uh, first to John Hardenberg, who was the executive secretary of the AVMA at that time. And he was instantly understanding and sympathetic. And he said, well, now, what organizations that we have should this go through? You know, the AVMA has to act on it. <laughs> who should be the approving authority? Yeah, yeah, and it went to the Council on Education. And... Uh, uh, the public health people, uh, one of their members talked to me and, and he said he heard what we were doing and, and he said, can I get a copy of your constitution, bylaws? And a little bit naively, I let him have them. I didn't think he was going to copy them. You know, I would never copy oh, somebody. Oh, you're kidding. Now but we're he getting, did. We're getting the lowdown on this now. He this is interesting. Them. He copied them and they sent in an application rather hastily and got it in within six months of ours they went in but we did get our application in first and Bill Thorpe made certain that that was made a matter of record and it is record and recorded that we were the first but they because they do claim at times they were first they do yeah. I didn't know but that. I'm, I'm glad I have this but story. they weren't the first and and the record uh, for the record it's recorded in this reprint on on the early history of the college the pathologists were the first John Hardenberg uh, recognized it in writing. He said we were, well, I had talked to him the year before, before we ever sent any correspondence in. And he had talked to the Board of Governors and, and key people. On, and, but the, the uh, Council on Education was given the task. And uh, they, they, they approved these two boards, ours and the Public Health Group. But then they decided when the third one applied that they needed a body that uh, was more directly interested in this business of specialization because it seemed to be growing. And the American Board of Veterinary Specialties, it was called an advisory board of the Council on Education, was formed. And there were there were representatives from educational institutions, deans, or two of those, and there were people representing 
the Army and the uh, Food and Drug Administration. And that, that, ca that council served, and eventually now is the American Board, or American Council, it's a separate council. But they had a lot of naughty problems to solve. To, sure. Uh, but they didn't have many with us because we were very careful that not to nominate anyone that wasn't qualified, even very good people, good researchers, but who didn't meet our criteria. Uh, but at that meeting, uh, and that was recorded in the, in this this the document that I wrote on the early history. These twenty. 15 of these 22 people met together and, uh, and came up with uh, some more names and we eventually came up to 50 people that were the charter members. And uh, uh, that's where the American College of Veterinary Pathologists was formed. And the, the principle was, is still the same. We were an organization, a national organization who would set standards in veterinary pathology and set standards for individuals and give them an examination and give them a certificate if they pass the exam. So it's a national examining and certifying board in veterinary pathology and it was the first of its kind in the veterinary profession. Well, you know, you mentioned the examination, which is uh, probably the most important thing the college does is administer the examination. Um, what's the, what, what was the first year they gave the examination and maybe just speak to the philosophy, you know, the philosophy behind the exam, uh, you know, minimal competence versus excellence, for example. Yeah, well, we were striving for excellence as best we could and, uh, and not minimal requirement, minimal competence. And uh, for the most part, the organization has stuck to it. The council decided whether they okay. were qualified to take the exam, they'd had enough training experience. And the first exam was given in 53, and it's been given every year since that time. And, uh, and uh, uh, I have well, having, having both taken it and administered it for several years, I can uh, still safely say it's uh, testing for excellence versus, yeah. uh, of course, some people may debate that in my case, but yeah. oh, well, the general well, population, it's, so. it's uh, yeah. for excellence versus uh, minimal competence. Yeah. So, uh, well, then, I, you know, it would, it would seem to me that then the ACVP has been kind of the model for other um, organizations to form colleges as well. Well, after the that, and still profession help. Uh, has established a lot of them. I've, yeah. I've lost track of them, yeah. but clinical specialties. And, and I think it's been very helpful to improve morale in the clinical specialties and get people to keep studying after they get yeah. through veterinary school yeah. and they're specialized. Well, if you want to think it's appropriate, you want anything else on the ACVP or do you, I thought the, uh, I would like to expand a little bit now back to going back to Hilton Smith and uh, particularly discuss how the, the textbook came about, if anything else. Well, to yes, that. I th maybe that's enough to say about the ACVP. The, the history has been written uh, up to, 60, to 61 and, uh, in, and published in the, in the uh, Journal of Veterinary Pathology. Yes, let's go back to Hilton Smith. Okay, uh, well, the, um, you wrote a uh, very prominent veterinary Pathology textbook with Dr. Smith and Dr. Hunt, one that almost every vet student in this country uh, uh, learn or cut their teeth on pathology. And mm -hmm. for people like me, I think uh, one of my interests in pathology came out of uh, not only the professors I had, but the book. I'll never forget the high quality images and the number of photographs that came out of the AFIP. Right, right. To be, and that's be honest one of with the you. And strengths, that's, yeah. I think that was one reason I was. Uh, always interested in maybe going to AFIP and eventually training there. So it was good PR for, good. for, for oh, the Institute. So now you're in the, we're in the, the sixth edition, which right. was just published. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, you can verify, I don't get any percentage of uh, sales. Well, well, but happy to but six, six editions. How did, uh, how did you and uh, Dr. Smith 
come up with the idea to do this? Well, Hilton Smith, I was a, his student, you know, at Washington State University, and we kept in contact for a long time. He went to Iowa State, and then he went to Texas A&M. And uh, he also came to the Army Medical Museum as a consultant. And we also kept up correspondence, but uh, we talked to each other very frequently, and almost always we talked about what could be done to improve the uh, vet uh, veterinary pathology, the, the whole profession, but particularly veterinary pathology, which we were both interested in. And one of the things we discussed was the, was the certifying organization, which I, became the American College of Veterinary Pathologists. But we also taught, talked about a, a textbook, and Hilton was particularly interested in it because uh, he was a teacher, you know, a very good teacher. And uh, we started uh, talking about this book. We even prepared an outline back in the 40s. We had an outline for it, and we, he was, we were both thinking and collecting material. And I started thinking about it and thinking, collecting material at, in the registry and earmarking cases for illustrations and things like that. And then when I came back from on my tour in Europe in 1953, uh, we started working on in earnest. And he uh, did a lot of the writing. I did selected most of the photomicrographs, and most of them came from material at the Army, Army Insti Armed Forces Institute of Pathology at that time. And uh, I worked uh, almost every evening, and uh, Saturdays and Sundays I spent at my office working on that book, so I spent a lot of overtime on it. Some of the photomicrographs I took on government time, but most of it, the work was done in overtime. Of course, you were highly compensated for that effort, I'm sure. <laughs> no, not financially. <laughs> Intellectually, <laughs> yes. compensation was... It was intellectual. And, yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, and he came here as a consultant. We did some work together on it here. And, uh, but most of it separately. We wrote our various chapters, and we'd each read the other's chapter. I went down to College Station on one occasion and spent some time there and wrote a chapter while I was down there. Two or three days, I guess. Yeah. And I guess maybe it showed it, but, but he read it carefully, and he thought it was representative of what was known about the pathology of skin of animals at yeah. that time. So... Uh, uh, Hilton had contacted Lee and Fibiger, medical book pu publishers, and they'd agreed it, to publish it, and we both signed a contract. And I got permission from General Dart at the time, who was then the director, and he was very supportive. Oh, yeah. He thought this was a wonderful idea, that it could do a lot of good, and, and he also felt it would... Uh, um, uh, kind of established veterinary pathology, and and he he recognized that the uh, illustration service here was just superb. And well, that's probably one thing that allowed you to do it was the the superb illustration. Right, and we had a lot of material by this time, ability. and uh, it was amazing how much material we had in, on animals. And uh, many of the illustration for the first edition in 1957 uh, were prepared at the Armed Forces Institute in their photography department and by some old timers who were really good at taking electron yeah. I think Roy Reeve was was still there. Wow. He took a lot of them for us and and there were other people that were, were also very competent. Well this was the they, first major veterinary pathology textbook in English. Is that well correct? it 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 was a sort of a breakthrough in quality. There were some lecture notes that Russ Runnels had prepared, and, and but they weren't adequate, we didn't think, to represent sure. the profession. And so quite a few uh, veterinary pathologists told me that that book stimulated them to go into veterinary pathology because 
partly because of the illustrations, the photomicrographs. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know a lot of them that would have told me this. That, uh, yeah. So that was very encouraging, and it was quite well accepted. So now it's in the sixth edition, and uh, the three of us put it together, but we also uh, asked six other people to write chapters, and that's in that edition, this yeah. sixth edition. The next edition will probably have a whole lot more chapter editors, I suspect. To get it through. It's just impossible for even three people now to cover the fields. Well, the, the, the depth now yeah. covered yeah. in each the area. New information in the last 35 yeah. is astounding. And uh, it's, But still, it's designed as a textbook book for students, and there's hope that it will attract students' interest and you'll get some pleasure and be attracted to sure. the subject. Okay, now in, in 50, you went to the European Command and were at the, at the uh, Fourth Medical Field Laboratory in Heidelberg, yes. Lonsdale. Right, um, and it was moved to Lonsdale. Okay, and, and you were there for about three years. Three years. And was that pretty interesting? I mean, was it... Well, yes, I had a charge of a field laboratory. I was at really a general laboratory, and there was a veterinary department. And we did, did food analysis and... Uh, and laboratory work on uh, uh, diseases of a lot of war dogs over there at that time. And uh, we, uh, so it's a general laboratory, but also I had my own extracurricular after I did all my required work. I was still interested in doing pathology and histopathology. And at that time, Fred Maurer, Colonel Maurer, was in, in uh, in Africa, and he was studying renter pest and some other exotic yeah. disease, several others, African swine now, there, now He was really a prominent leader in, in pathology of uh, exotic and foreign exotic, animal diseases. Exotic disease yeah. was his forte, and he traveled the world collecting materials, viruses and stuff. But he also collected pathologic material and sent them up to, uh, to me at uh, Heidelberg and then at, at Lonsdale when we moved. This was during the Korean War, and they had to reshuffle the positions of the Army installations in Europe because we were now, we were right up within nine, our, our medical depot, main medical depot, was nine kilometers from the, <laughs> from the front line. Oops. So that had to be moved, and the laboratory had to be moved. So there, everything, was, sport things were moved west of the Rhine, and the combat troops went to the east of the Rhine, so we were now on a different posture vis-a-vis -vis yeah. the Russians. Well, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Mara later on, Colonel Mara later, later on, uh, uh, was chairman of the Department of Veterinary Pathology. Yes, he was. Yeah. But he came here and was headed up the virology department. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, then later, after sometime after I left, he became the, the uh, uh, department, head of the Department of Veterinary Pathology. So... So we rewrote just two or three papers on the on our work, collaborative work, on on rinder pest and African swine fever and some other diseases. That's the way we did it. It was long distance. Now, you, you, you commented that, uh, to me earlier that uh, Dr. Thorpe was appointed Secretary of Treasury of the ACVP to replace you when you got assigned overseas. Right, when I went overseas. I guess one the question I was going to ask you, then he was later elected, is uh, you mentioned he kept after the AVMA for recognition of the ACVP. Well, what does it, that mean? It, well, you see, it took quite a while for the boards and various people to get our petition to be recognized. Oh, okay. So the petition just uh, to sat there for a while. And uh, and uh, you know, AVMA is a big organization. It took a long time, and this was a new new venture for them, totally new. So it took them a while. I think in 1950 was when they recognized us. Okay, so it took a couple of years for that to happen. So, okay, so then you, so you now did you did you spend some time in Africa as well, or are you just interested? No, no, okay. I I just uh, an opportunity I to had share the material that Fred sent me and worked on African diseases. But and then in '53 you came back. You were uh, you headed the the. Uh, the, the the veterinary pathology was it a section then or a department that time? It was still a section. Okay, I think. as part of the okay. a, a pathology department. Yes, it yeah. was. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
you're reelected to the Secretary of Treasury of the ACVP. Right. And uh, I guess a few things happened during this time that uh, stand out to me. We had the first pathology laboratory animal course was in, in 1953, and that's still going strong. And probably by far a majority of veterinary pathologists and uh, laboratory animal veterinarians have attended that course one or, or multiple times. Uh, the first Wednesday slide conference, yeah. uh, which started off as an in-house, from in-house or uh, conference, and I'll let you expand that on in a minute, but is now uh, like 135 institutional participants uh, all over the world. I think there's in the tw 23, 24 mm -hmm. uh, institutions in foreign countries that or foreign countries that have institutions that participate. And uh, I guess starting with the polar course, uh, what was the initiative, impetus to start that course? Well, this started uh, in the fall of uh, 53. I think it was, well, it was 53. Yeah, that's what we got here. And uh, there was a dinner meeting of uh, a group of people who were interested in laboratory animal medicine. And it had a, quite a few of the leaders. Uh, and I, I can't remember the exact list. I'd have to get it. Uh, but uh, I was invited to sit with them. And they were talking about how to develop laboratory animal medicine, how to get progress yeah. going, and how to, uh, what you should do. And, and uh, one, of, one of the people said, well, we need some educational programs. We need places for people to get further education and training. And I, and I volunteered that. I said, I think we could, we could start a course on uh, laboratory animals and, and emphasis would be on pathology because we're a pathology institute. And they thought that was a good idea. So the next day I, I came and I talked to General Dart about it. I came with an outline. I had an outline of what, what we would sure. do and, and I had a list of a few people that we would invite. And so I had it least sketched out so and he he was enthusiastic he approved it go ahead do it yeah so we had the first uh, uh, pathology of labrador animal course was at at the old red brick building uh, 1950 i think it was 53 right that's, 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 right, right, that's correct and <clears throat> we assembled uh, quite an interesting group and their papers I remember it was in the un unair conditioned conference room down in the old red brick building. So they were uncomfortable, but they were all enthusiastic, the people that attended it. And uh, uh, we had quite a few of the leaders in, in both the veterinary profession and the medical profession, people who had done work on animals. Uh, I can think of some of them, but I wished I and the proceedings were published. You probably have a copy of it uh, of that meeting, of what was covered, and 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 the papers were were assembled. And and uh, I remember a few people. There was Pappenheimer uh, spoke on uh, nutritional diseases, and he had discovered some of the vitamin A deficiencies in animals. And Pap Pappenheimer unfortunately died within a few months of that course. But his son, uh, John Pappenheimer, who was at Harvard, finished the manuscript for him. And later I got to know John Pappenheimer. He described what he did for his father. And, and it was a nice paper, a nice summary. And Frank Bloom, you maybe have heard his name, was a self-made pathologist. He was a small animal practitioner in New York, but he had a con established a connection <coughs> with the medical school in New York and had his tissue sections cut there in the pathology department. And, and he was sort of self-taught like I was. He, he participated in the, in the pathology seminars at, at one, I've forgotten the university, probably New York University, but it might have been Cornell. And he wrote several books on pathology laboratory, <coughs> on pathology of, of animals, uh, kidney disease, and other things. He, he, he was a very competent guy. 
and he uh, was uh, we he was taken as a charter member of the ACVP, and uh, I don't know. I can think uh, some of the other people. Unfortunately, I, my mind's blank on them, but you recognize their names. Yeah, well, and I think that's, I mean, uh, the, the Polo Course, I guess that we already mentioned, has just been uh, so you know, extremely you know, important. It was, later it was called the Polo Course, right. the Pathology of Laboratory Animals Course. Right. And it's gone every year, hasn't it? Every yes, year, as far as I know, year? it's been every year. It's uh, in every August. Yeah. Um, since that time, um, of course, we give a course with the Seal Davis Foundation mm -hmm. that's here. And a number of years ago, we started a course in descriptive veterinary pathology to, mm -hmm. to help people, particularly uh, those individuals that aren't in uh, real strong programs for descriptive pathology, and that's been very successful. And then the latest course is a course on uh, current uh, topics or in, in laboratory animal medicine that mm -hmm. focuses more on, uh, uh, I would say, the management side of laboratory mm -hmm. animal medicine. Again, recognizing, trying to identify needs in mm -hmm. either pathology or closely allied specialties. Mm -hmm. Um, we talked about the Wednesday Slide Conference, and uh, what I, I, I presume that when you guys first started having this conference in house, it was like a lot of places where you just get together once a week to to bring together right. interesting cases and discuss them. It was a form of continuing education. Mm -hmm. It was a form to to teach your your, right. your more junior people. Right. And what was the atmosphere in those conferences? Oh, uh, very interesting. I mean, and of course, it was opened up to the public at one time, uh, the people at NIH and other institutions. So it kind of grew, it started off internal then you get yeah. people from the USDA and NIH. Mm -hmm. Right. It was, a, it was interesting, there was a lot of give and take, a lot of discussion, and we usually had at least one expert that could settle it, yeah. knew what it was, and it could settle what the least was, or come up with a, yeah. a diagnosis. Not always, we didn't always settle it. But probably got pretty, fi they probably got pretty, uh, feisty at times too. I oh yeah, people like, were enthusiastic and they yeah. would get carried away at times. But uh, well, well, speaking of getting carried away, um, before we leave the before we leave AFIP, I, I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, Charlie Barron. I mean, he's well. Charlie Barron was a, a very competent uh, pathologist, and he uh, in pathologic anatomy he was as good as anyone I knew, particularly young people. But uh, he also had a strong personality. He was he had a, he was tall. He was a big Texan, and a booming voice that <laughs> sort of intimidated a lot of people. I think it did. For what I, I think heard, it, it did, intimidated yeah. a lot well, of people. Uh, I I I really liked him and and uh, respected him. And uh, and uh, he was a great deal of help in the training while I was here. He he. He liked to do it, and he, well, he was very demanding, and uh, that's what you have to be. Sure. To, well. think, do, to do that. So it was a sad thing when he died relatively young. But, uh, and he and I did get along splendidly. I think maybe we had mutual respect, and that was the basis for our, our interaction. Okay, now, so. I, it's, it's sometime during this time... Uh, of course, the Department of Veterinary Pathology over the years has trained large numbers of veterinary pathologists, large numbers of residents. We yeah. get three to four a year, mm -hmm. every year, a uh, big percentage. M most of those are board certified now. A lot of people visit the institute. I think mm -hmm. uh, when I was here, uh, we would get 80, at least 80 a year uh, veterinary pathologists coming right. in to use our yeah. training material. Well, so we, we, about, I, I presume while you were here, and chair of the, of the past section, that's when we started getting the first residents right, yes. and, uh, <clears throat> and training people. Out in 53, or, or maybe just before that. Is that something you requested or were pushed for? Uh, we, we let it be known, and the um, personnel office in the Army mm -hmm. and, and Air Force Surgeon General's office started assigning people to us. And that had advantages, but some disadvantages. One is that uh, nobody passed on their potential to be a pathologist. Yeah. And we got some, a few people who just couldn't make it. Yeah. And that was sad that we would work with them for a year or so and then have to tell them that we don't think they're going to, yeah. or they take the exam and fail it. 
Yeah, better to learn early than late. Isn't yeah, it? and it's better to be, to be told early that there's... But that's very difficult to do. Some people blossom later. And, and uh, so I, when I left the AFIP, I insisted I pick all the, the, all the people that I, I was going to train and take responsibility for. Well, we're, we're getting close to the end of, uh, of this session. Um, I thought uh, we would start uh, the next session may in your post-Army days. And anything particular you would like to, uh, any other memories of AFIP and uh, Army Medical Museum? You saw a lot of transition that time. It had a major impact on you. Well, I that. always had a very affectionate regard for the AFIP. And I, when I was asked to, I served on the Committee on Registry of Comparative Pathology tried to help with that being established. I I served on the the. Uh, Were you the pre weren't you the president of the American Registry of Pathology uh, at one time? The, when the well, this was after the Registry of uh, Path American Registry of Pathology was just, was reconstituted. You know, okay. it was it had a period of trial and travail, and it looked like it was the, that the American Registry of Pathology, which had been established in 1922 under yeah. General George Callender was going to disappear. And this would not, no longer be an international and nationally recognized institute of pathology because yeah, okay. it's through that registry that the sure. civilians uh, could, could participate, including the registry of veterinary pathology and the registry of comparative pathology. So uh, I was one among those and uh, hundreds of people, pathologists all over the country, really Really went to work. It. Went yeah. to work on Congress, and and uh, Chapman Binford was the kind of the point man here. But there were others. Yeah. Uh, but Chapman was kind of he was retired, and he was sort of free to do what he wanted yeah. to. Carl, we're going to have to uh, probably cut it right here. Maybe we'll spend a few times back at the next tape. All right. Um, we, the next session, revisiting. I'd, I'd like to touch on that a little bit. Then we'll get yes. into All right. Cornell That's and good. Angel. Carl, at the end of our last session, we were discussing your involvement in the American Registry of Pathology, and we'd started to touch upon the, the struggle to uh, uh, resurrect, I guess, the American Registry of Pathology. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, if you don't mind, why don't you just briefly uh, discuss that for a second, though? Well, we yes, the, the, uh, the American Registry of Pathology was essentially destroyed by action of a certain general. Yeah. And uh, it was unfortunate that it hadn't been given the legislative support long before. So the focus was to get legislation that would restore the American Registry of Pathology and give it a sound basis in, in, in a congressional act. And many, many people worked on this. And I mentioned that Chapman Binford was one of the point men. and. Also, Sam Silverman, uh, Robert Stoll, and uh, uh, Dr. Hume, who was here as a naval officer years ago, and uh, were among those people that w were very active. And uh, the the board was uh, it was reestablished, and it was authorized to have a governing board. And uh, it was put in action in the in the 70s, and uh, Dr. Hume was the first president, and he served for a couple of years. And the board is made up of representatives of the organizations who are sponsoring registries. That's right. the effect. And I was representing the American Veterinary Medical Association, and. Uh, Dr. Hume was the first president of the board of the organization, and Dr. Bob Stoll was the second. He at one time was the scientific director here, and I was the third. So. Um, yeah, I think you're probably still the only veterinarian to ever serve as uh, president of the American Red Tree. I think so. Yeah. I, I hope not the last, but I. No, yeah. Hopefully but not any, too. Um, so, and in, in, in then, so you were part of the. Uh, the group that worked to get it restored, the organization committee for the new right. ARP, yeah. which was established by Congress by law in 1977. I believe. Yeah. Is that right? Whatever. Yes, I think that's right. The emphasis at the time that I was the president was to 
build up its financial base. We didn't have enough funds to really do much, yeah. but we needed some sound advice and, and needed a, a, a good start to, to build it up. Sure. And I think, uh, I think of Richard Dick Palmer, who was our treasurer and our head of our finance committee. He did a lot to, to develop the, uh, put it on a sound financial basis, yeah. which it is on now and, what has, and can do a lot of things. But we were, uh, I felt some criticism, the fact that we didn't start a lot of new initiatives, but I felt we couldn't afford them. We didn't have the funds to do it. Yeah. And until we got on a good sound basis financially, we, so that was we could focuses. do it. And that's the way it's worked out. It's now on a good basis. And yeah, there's been a lot, of di a lot of changes just made in the last few years. Oh, yeah. Impacted. It's a very active part of the FIP now. Then you were a member, a full member of the, uh, the Scientific Advisory Board, the SAB. You would have represented the veterinary profession yes. on that uh, for a number of years. I don't remember the years, but it was after I very important left board. here, after 57, yeah. I was on it for five years, so I kept contact with the yeah, FIP. You've, been a, you've continued to play a big part in uh, uh, the, the life of uh, the AFIP. Mm -hmm. I think we better. It might be time to move on. Uh, you retired in '57. Yes. From sure. the army, you accepted a position at Angel Memorial mm -hmm. uh, Hospital in Boston, uh, and you uh, and you were at the same time you were research associate at uh, in Harvard at, at Harvard in the pathology department. Har yes, Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. And you briefly discussed kind of how you got your foot in the door with some of the consultants. Consultants from Harvard or well, Iran. those four professors that were consultants here all knew me, and and they spoke up for me, and and that was fortunate that I, so I got the appointment originally, and and uh, Dr. Damman uh, also was very active in getting me appointed to uh, to the Brigham Pathology Department, and Shields Warren to the uh, New England the um, Cancer Research Center at the Deaconess Hospital, and I served there quite a few years. So, so you had a dual appointment to Angel and, and Harvard. Harvard, and then eventually your offices moved from our, from Angel to Harvard. But did you maintain that dual appointment with Angel? Yes, I I kept the appointment for several years. Um, uh, Particularly when we, I was active in the training program that I established. One of the first things I, I did was to get a joint training program with, with the Department of Pathology at Harvard and Angel Memorial, so we could support training of comparative and veterinary pathology. Okay, so it was both comparative and yeah. diagnostic veterinary pathology as and, well. Uh, yes, and, and uh, we were trying to prepare people for an academic career, and uh, that, I think we did pretty well with that. We had two physicians in the program over the years that, that uh, participated and came to angel seminars and, and learned something about animal so, pathology. So to, to this day, does angel and, and Harvard still have a close relationship? Uh, it's been changing some, particularly since the establishment of the veterinary school at Tufts. Okay, that makes so, sense. So uh, I think it's a little less secure because of, the, of that arrangement. So, okay. Uh, I, can, I don't really know what's going on right now. I've been gone for almost 10 years now. You know, one thing I haven't asked you, did you, uh, were you involved in any way in the, in the development or the, of the veterinary school at Tufts? Yes, I was on several of their development committees on the curriculum and other committees. And I worked with them close, very closely. I was, John Mayer, the president, offered me the deanship at one point. Oh, really? I didn't, I didn't want to be a dean. I wasn't for that. Not much time for scope work. No, not for, well, I had a lot of things going. That I had a, a research laboratory at that time and, and working on cytogenetics and pathology. And so. Well, now, okay, so in, uh, in, the, in the late 50s, you established a uh, training program at Harvard in comparative, and it was NIH, had, you had NIH grant right. support, which continues to, it's, to stay. It's still active. It's still going and on. And I presume it was one of the earliest... Uh, it was one of the earlier, earliest ones, yes. And after I got that grant, I was appointed to the Committee on Training of the Division of General Medical Sciences of NIH. And I served on that quite a while, and I got to visit a lot of veterinary schools and medical schools and learned a lot about uh, 
the uh, structure of pathology in the country. Now you, comparative pathology resided within the Department of Pathology at Harvard, yes. is that correct? Mm -hmm. And you were there for how many years? A total of 35 years. 35, 35 years. <laughs> I just think of that in context of 22 years in the, in the Army. Yes, right. And uh, culminated, you eventually you became a full professor mm -hmm. in pathology. Well, what are some of the uh, outstanding contributions that you, looking back now, that you, you believe that, uh, uh, that were made while you were at Harvard? Well, um, the thing that I was most interested in was training of young people, advanced training. And we had quite a long list of people. We had one each year, we, so we had one time we had five at a time. And we trained them at Harvard, at the Primate Center, and at other laboratories where they, if they had an interest in some specialty, we'd find a lab. And also Angel, so they got uh, general animal pathology and uh, surgical pathology there. And learned the kinds of things you have to, pathologist has to know, sure. the lingo and all that. And uh, uh, so that training program was, I, th I thought, was very successful. We, uh, we placed uh, a large number of people in academic positions, and quite a few of them became professors in, in veterinary schools, and some in medical schools. But a very high percentage went on into academic careers. So. Did, you, did you offer a, a PhD? Uh, to sex-selected candidates uh, who wanted to spend the extra time that would and or wanted a PhD, um, if they uh, could qualify it with Harvard standards, and some did. Um, the, they they could get a PhD, okay. but in general, our program was to train people in in academic pathology, but uh, not necessarily. And they did a research project, most of them, all of them did. Yeah. yeah. But they did that in, in a research laboratory, in the, uh, either at the Primate Center or, or at other laboratories. Well, of course, while you were there, you worked um, with, with extensive with primates, you established a cytogenic lab. Yeah, my office was lab. at the Primate Center. And uh, what, are, what are, scientifically, what are some of the things you're the most proud of? Well, I had a, a research laboratory in cytogenetics of animals, and uh, I trained one, one uh, a lad did her, last did her PhD with me, got her, did a research with me on cytogenetics, and, and took over the lab when I retired. And uh, uh, the cytogenetics turned out to be quite important in uh, prim primatology because uh, the species were different. Some of them that were considered the same species or had different chromosomal configuration, sure. particularly Aotus. And the fact is one of the uh, species was, was renamed one of the, from, by uh, Nancy Ma, who was my uh, PhD student, and did most of the work as after I got out of it. And she showed that there were very distinct chromosomal differences between various species of aotus, owl monkeys. And one of the, one of the biologists that was studying owl monkeys uh, named the new species after, he called it Aotus nancy Maui. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just still its name. And it's characteristic with a very specific <laughs> chromosomal configuration. But anyhow, that and the training program, and I was also had administrative duties there as associate director, and uh, uh, I had charge of the visiting scientist program. So I helped the visiting scientists find places to work and people to collaborate with. And that well, was interesting. Must have been a wonderful place to learn and pursue yeah, pathology. It, was, it still is. It still is a really great place. And meanwhile, you you were still active in uh, the ACVP and. Uh, mm -hmm. AFIP and you know, the profession in general. Right. Well, one one thing I'd, I'd like to do, uh, uh, maybe right now, while uh, make sure we have time, and that's leave your career just for a minute. And if we have time at the end, maybe come back and discuss some high points. But mm -hmm. I, 
I'd like, if, if you don't mind, to spend a few minutes on uh, uh, describing your family. You've got, okay. uh, you've had, you were you were married, didn't you tell me, for over over 50 years. You had, you had yeah, three, three children years. and mm -hmm. what, seven grandchildren? Eight grandchildren. Eight grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk about them just for a minute? Well, you have to stop me if okay, I get going. I'll stop you after on the on the grandchildren. Yes, I well. married Dorothy Ann, Dorothy Ann Brought in 1935. Year, and we went to went to Monterey as bride and groom. And uh, I uh, considered the first three years of our honeymoon was at Monterey. Okay. So, our first daughter was Sylvia. Was born at Letterman General Hospital in 1938. Our son was born at Walter Reed Army Hospital in 1950, no, 40. And then our our th third child as a daughter was Anne, was born in uh, 1946, for six years. She and Walter her. Reed? Uh, Walter Reed uh, obstetric service was filled up. <laughs> I didn't get my application in soon enough. And she was born at, uh, at the... Uh, What's the hospital out here in, uh, in uh, not in Silver Spring, but uh, um, Tacoma Park, okay. Tacoma Park Hospital, where she was born. Okay. At that time, I was at Front Royal. But I'm, I was only laughing because uh, even to this day, it's difficult, to, uh, difficult oftentimes getting medical care at military facilities. Yeah. Well, the obstetrical service right after, a year after the war, you know, oh. it was <laughs> not, terrible. They were still building up. Oh, yes. Okay, so you had okay, through the three kids. Mm -hmm. and well, they've they've all made me proud, and they've among them they produced uh, eight grandchildren, which who are all marvelous, and I think. Uh, what did your kids do? Or well, do do? Uh, uh, my two ch daughters married right off, but uh, the oldest one was interested in uh, in. Um, history and uh, genealogy, and she's worked on the genealogy of the family, so I now know a lot of things about my family I didn't know before. Yeah. And uh, she also is a guild weaver. She we was weaving some very beautiful things. And my son uh, graduated uh, with a PhD in biochemistry and he worked for Dow Chemical for quite a while, and then he set up a business of his own and in, in, in computers, and he was very good at it, but uh, he eventually sold the business and started another one, and he eventually sold that, and he went to what he really loved to do, and that was to teach, and he's teaching in a high school and a college in, in Wisconsin, in uh, Minnesota now. He really loves it, he's just very happy there. And he has, you know, I'll skip around. My daughter, had, the first daughter has two children. One is an interpreter in Japan. And the other is a, uh, he's a poet, uh, but uh, he's working for Chase National ba Manhattan Bank in New York at the moment. He has to eat. The poets yeah, are hard yeah, to find it sure. difficult. And, uh, my son's three children, one of them is an audiologist and is trying to get into medical school. And the one is an artist and he's well established as a commercial artist. And the th third one who was uh, trained in international relations and languages, he's very good in languages, but he's uh, working for a uh, investment company, yeah, a, a company in International headquarters, a specialist in okay. trading, and uh, my youngest daughter married a professor at, uh, who eventually went to Princeton. She has three children. The oldest one's a girl who's a will be a senior next in fall at Stanford, and she already is a is a. Uh, Playwright. She's written a play that's been repro been produced on, in the, on a stage, experimental stage, and, and she's about she'll fi finish next year at Stanford. And her her younger brother is a is also a, for, he's the first year at Stanford. 
and is interested in the movie industry and wants to make movies and I know whether he'll produce them or what he'll do. And the third ch child in that family is a high senior in high school. He's a remarkable young man. He studied Chinese and included a trip to China when he was in grade school. And he's also studied Arabic and he's also studied Greek and he's apparently pretty good in all of them. But he will graduate next year. We don't know what he's going to do, what college he'll go to. But he's in a private school in Lawrence, Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Your third daughter? We talked about one daughter is... Uh... That's the third daughter, three okay. children. Okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the count, uh, eight. Hey, well, you got two. one that's a poet, one uh, poet works for the bank. Yeah. One is, uh, is a artist, one's an audiologist. Uh, one's a linguist. Linguist, and he's he's in Japan. Lives and then in there's Japan. three. There's two at Stanford. Did we miss one in there somewhere? I got the linguist. He's uh, yeah. He's the the son of the first daughter, and he's in Japan. Okay. In Tokyo. And then the three of my son's children included two boys and a girl. The two boys are artists. Okay. And and uh, okay stock uh, financial okay. man. Okay. And the third one's an audiologist. I just want to make sure we got them all covered here. Yeah, just in case, right, you do. Just in case somebody say, back say, home say, sees Granddad, the... Granddad, you uh, forgot me. That, yeah, would be that, bad. Wouldn't, that might be yeah, nice. Right. Well, I don't forget them. <laughs> but <laughs> it's hard. Well, I mean, I, I think that's really... That's, that's and, uh, interesting. My wife died in 1987, so we were married for 52 years. So, well, looking back on your on your career, um, what are the thing? I mean, okay, name just a few things that really stand out in your mind that you are that you're particularly proud of. Mm -hmm. We'll say professionally. Yeah. Uh, well, I had lots of opportunities and uh, just had a very happy life. I'm most proud of that. Yeah. But. Um, I enjoyed my associations here at the FIP, and I enjoyed the challenge of the research in the Army Veterinary Research Lab. And I think the thing that uh, I got the most out of was the trainees we had in pathology at Angel and very and, satisfying and, and Harvard. Some people develop and all. Of course, we started it at the FIP, and I had several people that went in, were in training and went on in pathology and did well. That's probably I'm most proud of, my uh, most pleased about, and those um, those people that are doing well. You know, you, I, I sort of feel that you're kind of the sausages are coming through <laughs> the, the the line, and you yeah. look at the best ones and you put your stamp on them. Yeah. And if it does well, if it comes a good sausage, and uh, then you're very proud of it. If yeah. they don't do quite so well, you you just feel bad. Some of them, uh, you know, they they fail in different ways. Some of them have died. Yeah. And uh, uh, you you're sad about them. You feel like they're pedagogic children of yours. And yeah, sure. And uh, no, I can very proud to of those that have done well. And, I can relate to uh, that. And are still doing doing well. And particularly that they went into academic work that they wouldn't have gone into otherwise. Most yeah. of them. Yeah, no, no. I know what you mean. You know, one thing that we didn't touch on that uh, we discussed briefly last yesterday evening uh, was uh, your involvement in toxicology pathologist in uh, the, um, uh, the the formation of the GLP, the Good Laboratory Practices. And uh, there was a time in industry when uh, when it probably wasn't as tight as it should be. You know, the, you know, the mm -hmm. con conducting yeah. of bioassay mm -hmm. studies and maybe you just want to speak on that for a second to well I I consulted with FDA a few times on things that I knew about and particularly on pathology of dogs and and I did uh, go, was in on a review of an institution that uh, had been very uncooperative with FDA and they were very up in arms about it and uh, 
I came in. They made me an employee for a day, uh, for food and drug. So everything was very legalistic. And I review, reviewed a study in the course of a day. I reviewed it with a lot of people watching and checking the slides and the numbers and everything. And it turned out that my results were very close in agreement with the pathologist who had reviewed the material before. And so this cleared the company's reputation quite a bit, I think. They, they did well on this, and they, they cooperated very well. Yeah. And, uh, but I think that some of the troubles hit, they, they and other companies had uh, were responsible for the establishing of the Good Laboratory Practices Act. Yeah. I always hated that because I somebody has to define good. Well, what good is what I say is good. Well, that is kind of bad. Somebody has a right, some bureaucrats. Yeah, right. right. Somebody, yeah. And, and there's a lot of argument still about what's good and what yeah. isn't good. Yeah. But it's helped, uh, right. it helps strengthen the um, and improve the work that's been done in Toxpath, I think. Uh, any question? No. So I was happy to do that. Um, you uh, another another item I want to make sure we we get recorded is your involvement with the International Academy of Pathologists. You're you're one of three, I believe, uh, veterinarians ever to be uh, president of that organization. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about that as well. Well, I served on the council, and at the end of that service, I was asked to run for vice president and president, and I was elected. And. Uh, the precedent for veterinarian being a, being a president was in uh, William Hugh Feldman, who was the president of the International Association of Medical Museums, which was the forerunner of the International Academy of Pathology. Yeah. And he, I don't remember what year, but he was the president. And then uh, Bob Leder was later president of the International Academy. So we all had a chance to serve, and we were all enthusiastic about that organization. And yeah, it's been a while. I mean, it's been a while since a uh, veterinarian's been the president of that. And I, I wonder, within our own profession, we've got, uh, uh, of course, a strong ACVP, mm -hmm. College of Veterinary Pathologists, Society of Toxicology Pathologists. I mean, there's a lot more organizations now for right, veterinary yes. pathologists to be involved in yeah. than I presume, by, and that may be part of it. I, That's taken I some know. of the membership away from the academy is unfortunate of veterinarians. But uh, it's still one of the great teaching organizations, is the International Academy. Yeah. They've had a program of training. It's superb. Well, I mean, are there any other um, areas you would just like to expand on or make sure we have we cover during the presentation? I think, best I can see, we've got covered the, most of the things we, just, we we said we were going to cover. I'm sure that it's impossible to get get everything. Uh, I, I think we probably could have many more hours of these sessions, and then maybe we will need down the road to have some focused uh, sessions in some of these areas. Um, I talked to a number of your, of your uh, students that you've mentored over the years, and, you know, I, everybody uniformly uh, Appreciative and uh, of your of your contributions to to their uh, education and their really love of, of pathology. I talked to one individual you may remember, uh, Paige Broussard. Uh, Paige uh, is a veterinary pathologist now at the Genetics Institute. Just happened to be your neighbor, I think. Yes. Never yeah. actually trained with you, but uh, yeah. I think he went on to be number one in his class in veterinary yeah, school he was and was with our company for a while. Just outstanding, but just by his interaction with you and. I think probably on a career day type thing went to went over to the well. Actually, center. a friend of mine arranged a, 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 an appointment for him. so like when he was in high school and I talked to him. He he was thinking about going to veterinary school and I talked to him about it and, and uh, uh, told him about some of the opportunities and he's done the rest himself. He's a very bright young man. I, I'm yeah. pleased with that. You know, if yeah, you, you never know, do you? What, you never know what you're going to start in motion. No, you don't. Um, yeah. The the uh, another another area we, we really haven't really hit much is your involvement with the International Life Sciences Institute and your your liaisons in, in uh, Japan Germany You've been very uh, very active internationally. Mm 
Um, and you've, of course, edited or co-edited numerous uh, textbooks, uh, organ system-based textbooks on, on toxicology. Uh, Sixteen volumes. Oh, only 16, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can remember just not a short time ago, you were working hard to finish those up, and you had the your, your vet path going. It was pretty hectic day. Right, you right, wanted to leave town, too, right. and get to New Mexico. Oh, I don't have quite enough energy to do all of that stuff. Well, and then, then I remember you related a story. Uh, you might want to let you do it, I guess, the, the story when you were in Japan a few years ago, and they invited you to attend a, basically the Wednesday Side Conference. Oh, yes. I, I wanted to tell you that, that I went to... Um, a, I was... I spent two weeks in a laboratory in, outside of Tokyo and uh, doing studies on my own, but I just had a place to work. And uh, one day they said, we're having a, a slide conference. We have several weeks accumulation of the AFIP slides. And we'd like you to come in and say something about the AFIP or speak to us in English. And then we want you to leave the room because we're going to talk Japanese <laughs> because we don't have to translate. It's yeah. too, it takes too long. Yeah. So they spent the whole day. Uh, I spoke to them about the AFIP and told them something about uh, why the AFIP was doing this and uh, what a great in educational institution. And they spent the whole day and then they talked to me, several of them, about how much they enjoyed looking at the... How many were there, did you say? How many participants? Uh, there must have been 50 or 60. Ah, it's amazing. It was a big group. I think we, you know, we take it for granted here. Yeah, you send out those slides, you wonder what happens to them. Well, I'll tell you <laughs> a more recent story. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, there's a young veterinary pathologist there contacted me. And she said she met me in an elevator at one of the meetings <laughs> and said, we'd like for you to come to our AFIP slide conferences. We have them every two weeks. And this is the New York, or the uh, New Mexico State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab in Albuquerque. At the, it's located in the University of New Mexico building. Yeah. And this, these people, by their own initiative, are, are going over the, sl the slides. They make make uh, uh, photomicrographs of the slides and show them. And I go down every two weeks, and oh, that is so it's, it's a 70-mile 70, 70 drive, and I make it in less than an I hour. I bet you love it. I, I, you, you, yeah. I, so, I bet so, you love it. Yeah, I tell yeah. you, it's really fun. It kind of goes back to my childhood, but uh, but the early days when it, when it was so much fun to learn new things yeah. about pathology. Yeah, that's so I'm I'm learning things from the FIP set. And that is so I, neat. I keep telling them about how good things are at the FIP. <laughs> well. But... Uh, there are some. Pe there are three people there, four people that have their ACVP exam board certificate, and I think there were two that were working on their preparing for the exam. And this is one of the units they use to help prepare, help them prepare. It's repeated all over the world. Yeah. Well, one thing, uh, Sandra Snook, one of your f former, I guess, r r residents or grad yes. students, asked me to was about to. You did some reproduction, repro research. Uh, and were involved with photographing uh, embryos at one time. Do you, is that a uh, with uh, Doctor? Is it Doctor Rock and uh, Hearst Tech? Is that a? Is that led astray here? Does that ring a bell? It uh, doesn't ring a big bell. No. Probably at the Primate Center. It was probably at the Primate Center. There was a lot of work that I had some ancillary f f influence on. A lot of things that we had to do was to be able to get animals to reproduce and and stab them disease free and a lot of other things that yeah. we did there. Well, we've covered a uh, a lot of territory. Um, anything else you'd like to discuss? Well, I don't think oh, I didn't say much about the Registry of Comparative Pathology. I was on that committee for 25 years or so. Only 25 years? Only 25 years, yeah. and I resigned a few years ago. But the chairman was, was Robert Whistler yeah. of Europe, and then uh, Dante Scarpelli. And I think he st last time he still was yeah. the chairman. And I, I believe that's the longest standing educational grant from NIH, isn't it? 
It's a long one. It's been yeah, there. It's a long time. Yeah. You know? And uh, I worked, there were, there were medical people and veterinary people together, and that was a, a very nice mix, to, I think. Uh, yeah. And uh, people like Kurt Bernerska and uh, Jack Frankel. Uh, yeah, and, uh, Jack Frankel. Both of those people are still around. Very powerful when you get you know, these multiple disciplines like yeah, that together. Yeah, right. And so, uh, and I guess Charlie Capon is still a member. Yeah, he still is. Right. Bob Leader was at one time. Yeah. And, and, uh, Bob Squire and Bob Lewis were on the committee. Yeah, Bob Lewis, I know him when he was on it. And that committee worked very hard to establish programs for the registry, and George McGaughy worked very hard to oh, he's put them in guy. effect. Yeah. Wonderful guy. Very hard working, very focused guy, yeah. Well, let me ask you this before time's up. What, what do you see, uh, I mean, I don't know if you thought about this or not, but uh, some of the issues that the uh, the, the veterinary pathologists are going to be facing in the next, I guess, millennium and, and well, leave some, some of the future. I, I've tried to think about the issues and decided that I didn't have the qualifications to guess about issues. But my feeling is that the veterinary pathology is now contains a very solid group of people that are trained in re recent, they, well, the first place they're intelligent, they're bright, and they're motivated. And they are trained, well trained in the discipline, and they're also adaptable. They, many of them have done other things and have gone on to some of them to be deans and some yeah. of them to be heads of research. Yeah, units a lot of deans. A, lot, a of deans. lot of deans. And I think it's partly because they were all organized and and that they yeah. could be a dean. And, and so pathology has, has helped a lot of the schools get uh, get a good yeah. dean. So I think that, that if, as long as they keep a positive attitude and be willing to learn new techniques and to yeah. use them, then still use their best skills with the present available techniques, that they're going to do fine. They're, they're obviously going to be involved with molecular, molecular biology and molecular biologists. Yeah. And, uh, well, when I started, the electron microscope wasn't even used. It, yeah. it wasn't available at all. So um, I'm very upbeat about it, and uh, somebody gets discouraged maybe because their their own situation is changing and they're having trouble changing, and then they tell them to keep their head up. Well, keep, you got to be able yeah. to change in today's right. world. is changing so fast. Oh, if, yes. There's no if, time to... If the college is not looking forward, being innovative, looking at where we're going to be. Um, and you're right, it's it's not yeah. easy. It's, no, uh, it's difficult. We'll, we'll be left behind. Somebody else will fill that niche. And I think they are. I think they're thinking. But as long as we uh, to attract uh, smart, uh, intelligent people who can look forward and can change, it does. It's not so important that we give them the try to think what they're going to have to tackle. If they have the ability to good change point. and they're intelligent, good point. And they work hard and good so point. forth. Yeah, I think you're a good uh, point. They're organized. And that's the most important thing because none of us can predict what's going to happen. Well, one area that uh, my perception in, in a large number of the veterinary schools, not not all, but a large number, is uh, the, the the path groups, path departments. I'm not sure as proactive as they ought to be, uh, uh, showing veterinary students um, how exciting this profession is. You know, mm -hmm. the clinical fields are obvious. So most yes. people, I think, go into veterinary yeah. medicine to be clinicians, of course, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I think the traditional feeling is pretty, you know, pathology, sit, sit behind a microscope and look mm -hmm. at slides, how boring can you get when we both know it's, it's not true at all. Yeah. And I think that's an area that we as a profession need to be better at. Well, two big changes that have occurred recently that were not wholly predicted, although some of them, parts of them were. The uh, importance of toxicologic pathology was evident yeah. some years ago. and and some people could see it coming. The presence of women in, yeah. in, in pathology and their ability to take over in pathology, yeah. or even the veterinary profession. You knew the number would grow, but never as fast never as it has. Never. I mean, well, we guess that it would be like well, it is. Over half. Over the, half of the people. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, some, uh, many of them are combining uh, two careers and, and doing well, but it's tough. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's very tough. Yeah. So uh, how that's going to be solved, but that involves the whole nation, not just our profession. But there's some very bright women that are very competent women that are in the profession, in pathology now. Yeah. So we have to get over some of our old-fashioned ideas we had. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the truth. The, uh, the, uh, we took, of course, we spent a lot of time on AFIP, and now things are going well. And I think things are going well for the AFIP, although, like any organization, um, mm -hmm. uh, in this rapidly moving environment, they, they've got to be able to change. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think they've gone through a lot of changes. I've gone away from being strictly uh, morphologic pathologists, which is extremely important still. I think mm -hmm. the, the, the bedrock we, we, we stand on to being very active in molecular pathology and molecular biology and uh, of course they're still very uh, education yeah. oriented. I might mention that uh, Ron Hunt, Ronald Duncan Hunt, who uh, got his pathology part of it here and part of it at his nutrition lab uh, with Sam Thompson yeah. and part of it with me at Harvard. He's retiring next week. He's going to have, we're going to have, there's going to be a party It'll for be, him. Be He's retiring, reparty, retiring as director of the of the uh, primate center, and he is a full professor of pathology at Harvard. I suspect he'll be emeritus. I don't know that. You can't count that until yeah. it happens. Yeah. Uh, Does that usually happen right afterwards, or you yes. never know? Or or maybe offered to you. When you retire, I presume that's based on your scholarly activities and, and total. Yes, yes, yeah. and your contribution to the university. Well, what do you uh, these days, other than coming out and doing things like this? What do you What do you do? What do you spend your time doing? Well, right now I'm I'm kind of casting about, but I do go to that that slide conference. It's yes, just, it's it's just fun. Uh, I'm casting about what I might do there, and I may do something on poisonous plants. I don't know whether I do well or not, but I'm thinking about it. And I have some hobbies. I like to garden. They have poisonous plants in New Mexico? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we don't admit it, but there are <laughs> it's some. It's like there. West Texas. West Texas. Has it. That's where most of them were described, you know. Yeah. Some of the most beautiful plants are poisonous. Yeah. Some of the plants that um, uh, are famous painter there. Uh, why can't I say her name? Um, Carl, I think we're down to our last well, 30 seconds okay. or so. Um, any final words? No final words. It's been fun. I enjoyed well, it. It's been a Thank pleasure, you. and I can't tell you how much I enjoy well, doing this. I, and an honor to be able to well, sit here and do well, this. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, and I appreciate your hard work. Love it. Coming here. Yeah.